Just a quick intro. My name is um, Shada. I'm a research director here at Bold Insight UK. I'm a clinician by background, so I've worked in obstetrics and gynecology ultrasound as a sonographer for a number of years in the NHS uh, before I moved into product development and user experience and human factors research. Having worked um, both clinically and uh, in multiple um, development teams, um, I have firsthand experience of some of the unique challenges and requirements in, in women's health domain. And really my work's been um, very much focused on understanding how um, people's interaction with devices impacts um, their lives and how to really optimize these tools to uh, create a, a better, more inclusive and, and accessible experience. So I'd like to just uh, pause and pass on to my colleague Martin to introduce himself at this point. Thanks, Shada. So I'm Martin Porchon. I'm a senior researcher at Bold Insight UK. Uh, I've been a researcher in user experience and human computer interaction for about 10 years now. And I've covered a variety of domains, often looking at uh, designing for things like chatbots and also um, uh, healthcare technology products and also the overlap between the two. And I've often worked in settings where we've been looking at designing for diverse groups of users, looking at either people in um, the global south or looking at people, how we design for people with lower language literacy or other groups who might be uh, marginalized or emergent users um, to technology. So my experience with Femtech and uh, the products today mostly covers thinking about how we um, design and uh, research uh, these groups to make sure that we're creating the best products possible. And I'll hand back to Sharda. Thank you. Great. OK, so um, let me just. OK, so just kind of a quick introduction on how Femtech UX Group um, came about, really. So um, throughout our, our work on multiple Femtech uh, solutions here, so we really recognized that um, there's some unique challenges and preferences in the, in the femtech domain. And this group was really established uh, to address those unique challenges and preferences um, of female users to make sure that their preferences are actually considered from the outset in the design of femtech solutions. So our vision is really around creating um, user-centered uh, products that really empower women to not only manage their health effectively, but also proactively, you know, to just really take charge of our health and well-being um, and be proactive about it. And of course, um, we all recognize that uh, women's health needs are diverse and uh, you know, they can vary significantly depending on uh, age, the stage of uh, our uh, life that we're in and um, you know, cultural differences, um, other health conditions that we may be suffering from and also socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. So um, it's a very diverse uh, uh, population, of course. And um, this group um, was really come together to, to foster collaboration and empathy and of course knowledge sharing um, and really our um, group is aiming to hopefully be able to positively impact uh, women's lives uh, worldwide and, and to um, be able to uh, create products um, and contribute to creation of products that are um, usable and safe and um, effective for use of course. So um, with that, I want to take you through um, some of the areas that we're hoping to cover in this webinar. So I'll talk a little bit about why Femtech and why now it's a good now is a good time to think about getting involved um, in Femtech. And then also um, just um, having worked in multiple development um, teams and cross-functional teams, just um, want to touch on solving the right problem. And I think it's a really key area to understand and to pay a little bit of attention and time and just sort of unpack what uh, problem solving uh, may look like in, in product development. And then I'll pass on to uh, Martin, who will uh, take us through uh, designing for inclusivity and also some uh, um, UX considerations for uh, Femtech products. And then we'll uh, summarize and uh, conclude the webinar. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, so uh, let's just uh, start with a little bit of a terminology 
um, here. So um, what does femtech mean? Of course, it's sort of what it says on the tin, right? So it's about a female technology and um, it, it is, uh, this term is used um, on a wide range of um, technology-based solutions um, that really cater specifically for women's health concerns. And um, interestingly, the term was actually um, coined by the co-founder of Clue, which is um, an app that um, assists women in managing menstrual um, cycle. And um, her name was Ida Tin, um, who uh, first coined the, the, the word femtech in 2016. And I'm um, just kind of thinking about um, what is femtech about. And really, I think in a nutshell, it's, it's all about enabling and empowering women to take a charge of their own health and well-being. Just going back to that proactive model of healthcare, being proactive about your own health and wellness and taking charge. And to hopefully, um, you know, be able to uh, drive um, equity and to improve opportunities um, in, in women's um, healthcare. So um, that's going to be it in a nutshell, but we will unpack this a little bit more um, as we progress. And you may ask why now? Why is now the right time? And I think really we're fortunate enough to be able to play um, our part in this really important shift um, that we're seeing in, in women's health and with uh, multiple different um, femtech products um, coming out around the world. And um, they've been really able to shift and impact uh, women's lives and sort of shift the mindset around women's health um, as well. So it's great to be a part of this uh, revolution, um, um, if you like. So, um, of course, uh, femtech um, uh, it comes uh, in, in, in sort of multiple shapes and forms, and um, it covers multiple domains. Um, and um, as, as you kind of evolve throughout your life, um, the, your needs and requirements change depending on your age, the stage of the life that you're at. Um, and it's great to see there are so many more uh, products that you know, we can use uh, to raise awareness and also to, to be able to use as uh, resources to improve our health and uh, wellness, really. So just to um, give you an example here. So take... Um, menopause as an example. It was really a topic that about a decade ago was really not very well understood or talked about at work um, and it was just really barely recognized in fact and you know with the uh, multiple different uh, femtech solutions that you will see now in the market this has really provided a very valuable tool and resource to support women going through this life transition it's uh, changed a lot of the, uh, the taboos around a menopause that uh, you may have seen um, and really it's it's kind of challenged the workplace environment to think differently to provide um, a different type of support a more inclusive healthcare plan um, to, to tackle some of the challenges that uh, women will face as they go through this um, life transition. So it's great to see that shift and that raising awareness and also to kind of celebrate some of the uh, big wins that um, have come as a result of this femtech revolution that we're all um, experiencing. So... Um, I want to, as I mentioned, I want to touch a little bit about, uh, to touch on um, on solving the right problem. And of course, um, solving uh, problems, whether it's in, in healthcare or in any other industry or in, in your life generally, it's really not a linear process. And I think we can all appreciate that. Um, it often involves a lot of trial and error to, to achieve a milestone. And you often may set out uh, to, to go from A to B um, and, and you think it's, it's, it's an easy sort of linear process. And then the reality is, is completely different. And I think, um, you know, the key is really here to get um, comfortable with failing and to understand actually uh, failing is part of the process and, and, you know, going as far as thinking that, okay, planning ahead that you will fail throughout the product development journey. Uh, and it's, I think it's important to also recognize that um, it's, it's good to fail early and often. I think it's much better to fail early and often than just fail once. Uh, so as you as you're thinking about uh, you, you know, solving a problem and the, the bigger picture around this sort of problem um, statement, if you like, 
um, it's really important to, uh, to also recognize that a uh, problem looks different on paper versus how it looks in, in, in reality, really. And um, I think this is where UX research um, comes in uh, and can be really helpful in bridging the gap between what you plan and what the reality really is by connecting you with those specific um, user groups that you're solving your problem with and the environments that they're solving the problem with and, and just taking into account uh, various different um, aspects of, um, of the, uh, the people and the environment and the tasks that you, you're designing. And we're gonna um, uh, go into this in a little bit more depth um, in the next couple of slides as well. So I'm sure we all agree that um, no one really sets out intentionally to create bad experiences. Um, and, you know, all of us designers, developers, researchers, we all work hard, uh, uh, you know, every day. Um, and um, we all sort of working towards creating better experiences. Um, and you might ask, okay, so why are there so many bad experiences around in that case? And I think it comes down to an important framework, but also uh, it comes down to the fact that, of course, designing good experiences is hard. Uh, and, and, you know, that that is, um, that is a fact. And that's, that's kind of what brings us to then looking at the, this framework around um, people, environments, and the tasks. And so the who, the where, and the why, I like to call it. Um, and you know, it's important to um, understand the people that we're designing for, so the, the user groups that we're designing for, and then thinking about the environments that they will be in. So uh, they may be in a hospital, they may be, uh, you know, in, in, in their house and juggling the home and work demands, they may be in the office. So uh, each different person, depending on the environment they're in, and then of course looking at the tasks that they may be performing, they will behave differently and they will have different flows that they may want to follow. So it's really important to uh, sort of um, make sure that every single dimension is covered and to unpack this slowly because it can get complex very quickly. So you really want to unpack this slowly, layer by layer, piece by piece to understand actually how does the person or the user, the intended user I'm designing for, uh, interacts in a specific environment with a specific task, right? So um, it's it's really interesting analysis and it really helps to get a good uh, baseline and grounding of you know, who you're designing for, where they're going to be and the environment, the intended environment that you're designing for and the tasks that you, you're um, expecting them to perform and, and are designing for. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to take you, I'd like to take you through um, um, an example here. So, so let's just use this framework that we talked about. So the people, the tasks, and the, the use environments. And um, I'll actually take you through an example um, that I've been involved in recently. Um, so imagine um, you're designing a fertility tracking app. Um, so in designing this app, you want to think about the people you're designing for, of course. OK, so they may be women of uh, or there will be women of reproductive age, of course, um, could be women with other comorbidities, other health conditions. Um, it could be women that have had uh, uh, multiple pregnancies already, or, uh, you know, they may be struggling with conception. So you really want to understand some of the dynamics in, in those user groups to be able to design for them effectively. There may be partners that are also involved in that. There may be first time users, of course, or serial users and some of the considerations there that you want to think about. And then, of course, uh, you know, they may be using this information or sharing this information with their healthcare practitioners. And, and what are some of the considerations there, perhaps, that we need to think about? Then, you know, looking at um, the complexity around various different user groups that we just sort of mentioned here, and then taking that and then adding the complexity of your use environment. So, you know, where can these users be? They may be at home, they may be on the go, at work, 
could be a very dynamic and, and complex environment that they may be at. It, it's, it's possibly often stressful. They may be multitasking. So it's just sort of unpacking some of the uh, intricacies around uh, putting the people that you're designing for in the environments that they can potentially be in. And then thinking about the tasks that you want them to perform using your product and your solution. So, so we, we talked about, you know, uh, we're designing a fertility tracking app and just thinking uh, some examples of tasks that you may be, um, you may be uh, providing uh, your users with are sort of, of course, there'll be tracking of your menstrual cycle, so they need to be able to do that. Um, then again, they want to be able to predict ovulation because that's vital for conception, of course, and how they can do that, again, is important to flow that they have to, uh, to go through in, in various different different use environments, perhaps, um, and, and some of the constraints around those that we'll touch on in a second. But then some of the other tasks that you may want to consider are, for example, notifying the users about uh, some of this information. And of course, the timing of the notification is very important. The messaging um, and, and, and the localization, some of the ling linguistic variations around that could be extremely important. So these are very sort of um, interesting areas that you want to think about and consider as you unpack some of the complexities around your user group and the tasks that they need to uh, be able to perform. And then again, of course, I don't think um, I've ever come across any sort of product development um, efforts uh, without constraints. There will always be constraints, and I think that's just the reality of life. But then understanding those constraints is important, and then prioritizing to make sure that you get those table stakes right, and then um, understanding um, how to prioritize some of those constraints accordingly as well is, is very important. And then again, thinking about some of the realities around product development, because of course there will be competing tools, there'll be other fertility tracking apps out there, and there will be some tech skepticism among your user groups, and you know, some of this information that we're providing, they may be thinking, okay, um, how true is this? How accurate is this? Can I trust it? Is it backed by science? So that element of trust comes into some of the some of the work that you do, and it's extremely important as well. And I know Martin's going to touch on this a little bit more um, as we go through this um, talk. Um, and then thinking about some of the training needs um, for your user groups um, and and how that training is delivered, and uh, you know how easy uh, it can be delivered or how quickly it can be delivered. In depending on the use environment uh, that your user group may be in, that's also a very uh, important consideration. And of course, um, privacy and security, um, whenever you sort of are working with people's data and they're inputting any of their information is extremely important and is often high on the agenda for the users as well as developers to make sure that all this information is um, as private and secure. So um, you can quickly sort of uh, begin to see that um, there are a, a lot of sort of uh, complexities around this um, dynamic and intersection between the people and the tasks and the use environments that, that uh, you're designing for. And, and, you know, user research really helps in a sense to unpack um, every single sort of um, item here and to better understand that sort of, um, is walk through the user's uh, journey, essentially. So a day in the life of your, um, your user could be really helpful in really understanding uh, the problem that you are solving for. Okay, so we talked about um, this framework and the intersection between the people, the use environment and the tasks. I just want to now touch um, on you know designing for a good um, experience um, and and what is um, a model that we have used over the years that has has worked well so if you think about uh, product development it's really this iterative um, process if you like so 
Um, it's very much um, a, a rapid, um, iterative um, a sort of um, a flow that can be informed um, well through research from the outset. And that's really important to make sure that, you know, from that exploratory phase, from that brainstorming and planning phase, you're able to do some desk research, perhaps, or even some uh, small in-depth interviews with your intended uh, users. Um, and just thinking about some of their needs and requirements from the outset uh, before you, uh, you sort of go further into design. And then in, in the design stage, it's extremely important to, to use, you know, a prototyping, rapid prototyping, even if it's low fidelity prototype, it's really important to um, get some concepts uh, down on paper or on any of the softwares, and then uh, go back to the users and talk to them to understand uh, what resonates with them, what doesn't resonate so well with them, perhaps, and then uh, what are some of the changes that you may be able to implement rapidly to be able to sort of um, work towards a development plan. And then sort of going through this iterative cycle, you then get to the development stage. And as you uh, work through your version one to your version, you know, 10.5, you you quickly see that, you know, you user research can really inform that development roadmap and enable you to take this uh, information around your user, around the use environments and the tasks that they need to provide and, uh, and implement that throughout your development process. It helps you understand some of the, as I mentioned, table stakes here, what you really need to make sure that you get right from the outset and then what are some of the nice to haves to, to add to um, to your plan going forward so it's a great way to make sure that you are uh, being kept honest throughout the development process uh, and that you know you're continuously using user feedback to plan your development journey and and work um, towards um, you know, deployment. So if if we think about then the uh, the test and the quality assurance process, this is also extremely important. Whether it's a medical device or a health and wellness app, I think this can be done on a small scale or a large scale. It's really important though to make sure that you validate the features um, that, um, that you're developing to make sure that they're safe and effective for use um, and the intended users are able to perform those critical tasks that they're you're intending for them to, to perform. So this is a really helpful sort of stepping stone prior to deployment to make sure that um, you know you've got you've got it right and and things are working as they should as you intended them to. And then again, it also gives you an opportunity to improve rapidly should you need to before you go into deployment. Now, in the deployment stage, of course, um, this can be a soft launch, a more controlled way um, of deployment, if you if you like, or it can be done on a larger scale. Uh, but you know, uh, from my experience, it's been it's been a little bit more uh, controlled and and. Um, and more comfortable to do a, a more of a, a sort of a smaller scale deployment where you perhaps deploy on a smaller set of user groups is more controlled you you have that open feedback loop that you're able to sort of take feedback on and iterate rapidly to be able to improve anything that may need to be um, improved as you sort of think about going into a full scale deployment and um, and then again that's where user experience and um, methodologies such as ethnographic research are really helpful in getting data from the ground and seeing your product in action and sort of making sure that that you're on the right track and um, we're on full-scale deployment so this um this is really a very agile nimble iterative process to get you through um uh, the development cycle but in a way that it keeps you honest and it makes sure that you know you have the uh, the user feedback sort of informing your journey as you move through the development process. Okay, so with that, I just want to sort of summarize a little bit um, here and Really, uh, the key is that, of course, one size does not fit all, and, and I think that's really important as we um, go through the uh, the development cycle and for for all um, femtech products. And it's it's important to um, test often, test early, um, and and of course um, get um, honest user feedback and and to be able to iterate rapidly and and um, sort of restart that process again. Uh, it's also important to create 
early successes and to celebrate those, right? So uh, whether you think about early adopters and advocates, um, you know, when you're thinking about uh, uh, creating um, some of those uh, feedback loops where you can quickly tap into their knowledge and understand um, where you are in terms of uh, the performance of, of uh, some of the, um, the work that you're doing. And then again, um, moving into sort of monitoring in, in the deployment phase and um, looking at day one, week one, and looking at some of the comparative data. How well are you doing? Where could you uh, improve? Where are some of the pain points that are coming out? Um, and you know, how can you address those quickly? Uh, so um, I think the key is also to really don't do too much too soon. It's great to be able to sort of take a step back, unpack um, and use this um, framework of thinking about the people you're designing for and the environment and the tasks that will be um, a part of this sort of framework and making sure that, uh, that you're able to um, unpack all those scenarios and, and uh, design for that effectively. Um, so with that, um, I think um, I just want to um, mention, um, of course, um, you know, taking into account your users' uh, needs and requirements and uh, making sure that you've addressed their pain points uh, where possible and just having a deep understanding of their situation um, at the end of the day uh, would improve adoption. It, it, you know, the users will know that somebody actually sat down and thought about uh, some of the challenges that they may have to go through um, throughout the, the workflows that, you, that you've designed. And then, of course, um, there is that value to the end user. You're no longer nice to have, uh, and you're, you're actually part of their, their life and their, their journey uh, now. So that's, that's great. That's a great place to be, really. And then there's that trust and brand recognition brand recognition and, and that brand equity, really. That's extremely important um, uh, to sort of sustain use and adoption. Um, and then, of course, there will always be that organization value um, as a result of this, uh, which is which is great, um, great to, to achieve. Um, so I just want to leave you with um, one of my favorite, uh, favorite quotes, really. So you can have um, the greatest tech and science in the world, but if people can't use it, it doesn't work. And I think um, that really uh, summarizes uh, what I've been sort of talking about in, in the last uh, 30 minutes or so. So um, I'll, I'll like to hand over to my colleague Martin at this point. Um, and he will uh, talk to you um, a little bit more about um, designing for inclusivity and, of course, some of the UX considerations for femtech. Over to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Sharda. And uh, thank you as well to the people asking questions in the Q&A. We'll come back to all of those at the end. So I want to think a bit about inclusivity uh, as a topic here. So Sharda talked about the motivation behind femtech and also the Femtech UX, UX group. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, going through some of the problems we've seen uh, working with clients and also looking at various products and working through to how we can understand to design products uh, better for users. Of course, that is the core vision, the core motivation of Femtech itself. So I'm going to draw upon some examples um, today. And you know, for us, when we're looking at this space, uh, Femtech, is really about uh, the idea of health and well-being being accessible and equitable for all. Now, that's obviously quite a lofty claim, uh, and uh, it's not something you're going to achieve on day one, as, as Sharda said. Um, but we're here to talk about creating products and services that empower women and turn them, uh, and in turn, enable them to take charge of their well-being and to actually be able to move forward in their life. Now. This is a big claim, but actually the way we think you achieve this is by embracing diversity. So uh, this is about creating products that uh, celebrate and draw upon the full range of human diversity. And most importantly, this means also learning from and including people uh, from a range of different perspectives. So we've already talked a bit about that today. Sharda talked about her uh, methodology, the framework as it was. But of course, there's a caveat here. Designing inclusively doesn't mean you're making one thing for all people. 
if you're designing for a diversity of uh, uh, users, you maybe have to consider different ways of solving problems for different groups of users. Um, this is, of course, all intrinsically linked, inclusivity, diversity, accessibility, and so forth. But I do want to caveat this as well and say this is not just about designing for disability. Um, there is also, however, a push here coming through uh, on the uh, accessible angle. So in the European Union from next year and, and the forthcoming years, the European Accessibility Act is actually mandating that all newly marketed products and services adhere to accessibility standards and that they must require companies to undertake regular compliance checks and reviews. So the guidelines don't specifically state what disabilities you have to consider or how you address them. It's actually up for companies to take stock of their users, to understand what their users' needs are, uh, to understand how their users are using their products, and to work out what is the most appropriate action for them. So although we think this is core for Femtech, and this is why we're here today to, to move, move this forward, we also do recognize that there is this larger push in various legal jurisdictions. And of course, things that happen in one jurisdiction often trickle through to other jurisdictions as well. But it is worth saying, this isn't just about disability. So when we think about our users, we often think about uh, things such as blindness or, or physical impairments. And these would be maybe categorized as uh, permanent conditions where somebody can't use an app in a traditional way or a product in a traditional way um, because of a physical impairment or um, and so forth. But actually, we want to also think about people who have temporary or situational conditions. So when we think about things like cataracts or, or even pregnancy, this actually might have impacts on how people use our products. These are only temporary for a person. It may last you know, a week. It may last a few months. It could even last years. But it may be something that actually a user doesn't consider themselves disabled. Um, however, they may still need to have different considerations when it comes to the design of products. And situational. I was trying to find a, an example here of being distracted and I ended up on a cat. Um, because we've all seen thousands of videos. If you go to YouTube, um, that's one of the BBC News website today even, of a presenter trying to do a live bulletin and a cat jumps up on the bench and starts trying to grab attention. We all know this. Uh, but actually in the real world, when we're actually dealing with products that we're using, we're often facing distractions. And this actually feeds into how we think about the design of products. And I'll give some examples later on of how it is. It does seem trivial, but actually we actually have noticed that it starts to have an impact on certain users. And once you start to think about certain users, you actually discover that something minor can become quite major. Moving on. So Shada helpfully set this up and we talked a bit about the ways that we can find out and do research. And coming from a user experience practitioner perspective, there's three ways that we typically work to understand our users and what matters to them in designing products. So these tend to be things like we do checklist or heuristic evaluations, and I'll give an example of one in a minute. We also look at things like surveys and large scale data collection. And finally, we also do things like foundational or exploratory methods. So they could be diary studies or interviews or focus groups and so forth. So at one end, we have things like heuristic evaluations. And these are often reliable, well-tested solutions. We can mostly objectively evaluate the design of a product, check it against a series of guidelines, and see what works and what doesn't work. And we can do that you know, within a week. And I'll show you an example. But actually, we really do catch a lot of low-hanging fruit with these sorts of evaluations. Surveys and large scale data collection are great, especially for uh, you know, web-based and app-based products. You get lots of information, particularly quickly from a wide audience, and you can do rapid decision-making. Of course, there's a risk here that you're averaging out users. If you sort of collect a load of quantitative data, you may average out and actually lose those nuggets of information about certain user groups. And finally, uh, foundational exploratory research methods, generally slower, more in-depth approaches, and you can get those rich insights into users' experiences, but perhaps you want to target particular demographics to be more selective uh, so that you can understand your users. And really, each approach has its own strengths and weaknesses, and you know, perhaps you, know, you try uh, a trifecta of all three. But thinking about these heuristic evaluations, one of the most common examples that people use, and it's been developed for, for many years now, is for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. And this is something we have experience with at Bold Insights as well. 
And this essentially evaluates a web page along the lines of four different outcomes. At Bold Insight, we've also adapted this so that we can use this in app-based uh, evaluations as well for desktop and mobile applications. So the outcomes here are mostly self-explanatory, but I'll go through them very quickly in an anti-clockwise order. So we have perceivable, and this is about how information is presented to users. Can they easily perceive it, including text equivalents and so forth? We have operability. Can people use the app? Should Can they do it with ease? So can they put input through different modalities and so forth? Understandable is the content readable and comprehensible without undue effort. So do users, can users predict the layout? So if they're familiar with the layout of the app, is it consistent all the way through? And robustness here is about taking a long-term perspective. So does, does the engagement of screen readers and other technologies uh, follow standards? So that perhaps if a new technology comes out in the future, another assistive technology, users can then continue to use your app without requiring updates. So if you think about the examples we've talked about already, uh, we could already start to see how these all would perhaps be caught by a heuristic evaluation like this. So if we consider um, you know, that, that those three examples I gave before, the blind user, somebody with cataracts and somebody distracted, we can start to think about perception and engagement with screen readers as applied to some of those. But also if we look at operable, things like adequate time to read and use content becomes very important. If we're showing content to users that only stays on a screen for three seconds, and then the user is meant to take action. Well, that's great if a user has the, is sitting down in front of their computer, sort of siloed away from the world, just doing nothing else. But actually, we know the real world isn't like that. So many people will be sitting in an office, you know, people are talking, their phone rings, a cat walks in if they're lucky, and so on. So we start to see the real world is actually a bit more chaotic than perhaps we would expect. So if we're designing for the real world, if we're designing for people to be able to use a product quickly and easily in an location, Maybe actually thinking about adequate time to read content is uh, a an, an much more important criteria than we may have considered before. And so this is just to give you a flavor of how even sitting down and doing a sort of a, a desk based heuristic evaluation can start to tease out these examples. But I want to go through six more examples now of, uh, from our work evaluating femtech products and, and other similar related products. I want to talk about six core considerations that we've identified. And these are trust and security, intuitiveness and ease of use, sensitivity to users' needs, empowerment and inclusivity, accuracy and reliability, and cultural appropriateness. And I'm going to go through each of these uh, one at a time. So thinking about trust and security. So trust and security is a Anyone who's done an interview before with a participant and tried to understand whether they trust a brand or a product will know just how hard it is for people to explain their trust, especially if they have trust for a brand. If they don't trust it, people can usually say why. But if they trust something, you start to learn that trust is a very multifaceted, hard to explain, hard to quantify experience for users. We, we tend to see certain themes coming out though. So we can start to say, well, maybe trust turns upon things like transparency and simplicity. So think about how we design our applications, our products. Um, are these uh, using simple language that's appropriate for the users? So thinking about the target users, what understanding they might have with them. And the femtech space is very exciting, but actually what's happening in femtech is we're creating new product categories that perhaps didn't exist five years ago, perhaps, you know, don't exist yet, that will come to market in a few years. So whereas people may have an understanding of how a particular product works, um, when they're looking at femtech products, they may be coming completely uh, without any prior understanding. And so we don't want to be in a situation where we start to overpromise and under deliver. That could have negative consequences. People might see something and say, finally, something to solve my problem. Going back to uh, a point Shada was making, but actually, if it doesn't solve their problem, if it just sort of educates them, actually, that's going to be a disappointing thing. It could hurt trust. It could hurt trust in, in a way that impacts not just the product the brand, but also the category. And I think this is uh, links very nicely to Sharda's uh, takeaway message that really, um, without trust um, you know, of a product, we probably end up with no users. And this is especially important in femtech because femtech touches upon many personal topics. 
So intuitiveness and ease of use, this is the home turf of a user experience researcher. This is what we spend a lot of time looking at and absolutely the same things tend to apply to FemTech products. Considering the specific situations our users are in, uh, making sure they're easy to use is of vital importance. So when we consider our users, we might think, well, actually they're just people, but actually they may be doing things like going through pregnancy that may impact their availability to use a computer at all times, perhaps they have tiredness or have fatigue, or if they've just given birth, uh, maybe actually they're gonna have other things on their mind than playing with an app. So if an app tries to gamify things, for example, on a phone, so if anyone's used language learning apps, you know, they try and nudge you every day to play a game and so forth and to learn a language. But actually for these particular cohorts of users, that may not be an appropriate route, for example. So what we've tend to said is actually we want things to be intuitiveness, uh, to have intuitiveness and to ha have ease of use, but perhaps avoid distractions and gimmicks that disrupt the user's journey. And one takeaway experience we often find in research is when you have research findings, the best moment is where you look at the research findings and think these are common sense. And uh, what you tend to find is, well, if they were common sense, we would have known them before. It's actually just they make sense. So the sense is not always that common, but actually that's part of the research process is to get to that stage. So then thinking about sensitivity to users' needs, and this is especially important now because we're dealing with uh, very intimate and personal topics related to people's well-being and their health. So we say extra care is actually needed with language here. And this is in a number of ways. So first of all, we want to think about avoiding, avoiding the risk of over-medicalizing the user journey. And what I mean by that is we don't want it to sound like we are a doctor or a physician trying to cure people. And, or we also want to avoid situations where we start actually linking things to particular diseases, perhaps. Now, I'm sure uh, I'm not alone uh, with anyone on this table. Now, I'm sure I've Googled their symptoms before. But I know I have. You have you know, a sniffle or a little, a little bit of a cold. You Google your symptoms and you, know, you can have anything from a cold through to the most extreme of diseases. And this is actually something that we really want to avoid with Femtech products. Again, the point of Femtech was to empower people and to uh, you know, support them and to and help them engage with their health and well-being. And actually, this can have detrimental effects. So what we do say is in these sorts of situations, the best course of action is always to direct users to seek professional medical advice when necessary. And really, that's actually a, you know, a safety net in terms of legal uh, perspectives, but also it actually empowers users more. It says these things, you know, perhaps that's what your medical physician can handle, and we are going to focus perhaps on well-being. The third point here that I want to stress is thinking about sensitive issues as people's user experiences vary. And I'm using user experience here in the real world experience, not in the uh, computer sense. For example, pregnancy is generally a time for celebration for many people. It's very easy to have an experience that sort of frames this in a very positive and celebratory way. But actually some users may be having a difficult time they may actually find overly positive messages off-putting to their experience. You know, they may not want to use a product anymore if it constantly frames pregnancy in a positive way and they're not experiencing that way. Of course, there's also a much more serious risk here, but actually you may start to make people feel that actually they've done something wrong or that something's gone wrong, but it's their fault that it's not so enjoyable for them. So embracing sensitivity here is key. And now. The next one is the core of Femtech. So this is going to be probably one I can go through particularly quickly. Um, but of course, the whole point of this is about using inclusive and positive language to empower users. That doesn't mean we're not going to talk about sensitive topics. Femtech by its very nature has to touch upon those. But actually we want to provide options for how users can take charge of their health, get extra information and understand uh, what's going on with them. And that also means companies have to understand and work to understand their users. Now, anyone who's used any products like this will understand that you go through onboarding processes, often there's various bits of data collection. And we think we found that those are quite important because users' experiences change over time. So Sharda talked about this. A user's needs at the start of their time using an app might be very different five years down the road. They might be very different tomorrow. So actually working to understand your users through a continual process becomes very key here. And 
Likewise, providing opportunities for users to feedback and iterate on design becomes vital. Again, another hopefully more obvious one for people, um, but this is about accuracy and reliability. Now, I've already talked about with trust, how clear and simple language is often seen as accurate and trustworthy by users, but we still want to provide extra information to help boost their perceptions of reliability. So when we found things like people trust certain sources for information, whether it's public health providers in the UK, it would be the National Health Service, other countries have other public health providers or NGOs that act as trusted sources. So you provide your information and then say, actually, and you can verify it in this way as well. And finally, one which I think is particularly pertinent for Femtech is the idea of cultural appropriateness. Now, again, everyone pretty much accepts that different languages and cultures have different words and names for the same ideas, same topics. And it's easy to forget that actually basic understanding of routes to healthcare also vary between countries. So in the UK, for example, uh, the government has decided in the last few years that pharmacists are actually going to be doing much more consulting than they would have done perhaps historically. But that's different to each country. And that's actually different to how it was even 20 years ago in the UK. So things are constantly evolving and changing within countries. So understanding users' context can be particularly challenging to unpack. And it really does require developing research uh, and you know, perhaps even generating personas of people's different experiences between countries, but also within countries. So it's especially true thinking about sex education and well-being education. This varies between countries, but it absolutely varies within countries as well. So two people going to two different schools in the same town or city might have vastly different understanding of their health and well-being. So understanding level setting uh, with users up front, you know, to understand what, what they're coming with to your app or to your product is actually vital here as well. And so really that's sort of my run through summary of these six key areas and actually I think how they all relate to designing femtech products for users. So Shada and I, we sat down, we wrote our slide deck, sort of we planned it all out and uh, we said we must have a summary at the end and uh, we came up with this. So we were trying to think how do we summarize all of this that we've been saying and really we think the core of delivering a better femtech experience uh, is about understanding users, their needs, their problems, their experience of products, the environments they're working in. Essentially, that is the summary of the last uh, 51 minutes we've been talking. The design of products shouldn't be static. It won't ever be perfect on day one, but actually through revision, through reviewing, through reflecting uh, on users' experiences, together we can all build better femtech products. 